Hello, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on new DBGS strategy for maximizing profitability. Uh, today's uh, webinar is being hosted by Dakota Gold by Poet Nutrition. Poet is the world's uh, leading producer of ethanol. Part of Poet's ethanol production process includes a cold cook process where uh, less heat is applied than other uh, uh, ethanol production processes. This results in a DGS with very unique uh, nutritional characteristics, which is marketed as Dakota Gold. Poet Nutrition, as part of Poet, uh, coordinates sales and distribution of Dakota Gold for both domestic and global markets. And uh, this is all done while focusing on consistency and quality of its DDGs. Research has demonstrated that Dakota Gold is, supports optimal performance for all species of livestock. Uh, for more information, go to dakotagold.com. My name is Kevin Herrick, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, key learning points that, that we'll uh, be covering with the, the webinar today are um, an overview of some of the, uh, the nutritional characteristics of DDGs, as well as a review of uh, DG management and information on DDG market. Today's panelists are Dr. Bob Toller from Extension Swine Specialist from South Dakota State University and Andy Lindsay, Merchandising Manager from Poet Nutrition. First of all, um, just to give you a little, little information, uh, we'll have a couple poll questions as we go through today's webinar. So the first poll question that we'll be having is during the next six months, Will your use of DDGs increase, decrease, or stay the same? So when you get an opportunity, uh, please select an option. Additionally, if you have any questions uh, for the presenters, uh, please use the, the question option and your panel on your right-hand side of your screen. And when we get to the end of the presentation, uh, we'll have an opportunity to review those questions and answers with the panelists. So with that, Let's go into, um, start with the presentation. So Dr. Bob Toller will be presenting new DDGS strategy. Um, Dr. Toller received his BS and MS degrees from South Dakota State University and his PhD in swine nutrition from Kansas State University. I uh, returned to South Dakota State University as an extension swine specialist and now uh, focuses on helping pork producers um, and students in the state and region. Dr. Toller just returned from, uh, to back to South Dakota for, after working um, at the Vietnam National University of Agriculture in Illinois um, on a full bite, full bite uh, uh, fellowship. So, Dr. Toller, floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Dr. Herrick. And I'd also like to thank Poet Nutrition for giving me the opportunity to visit with you all this morning. As the title indicates, I'm going to be covering things that affect DDGS use in swine diets. However, I can't cover all the topics in depth in just 25 minutes. So I'll be discussing them more at the 30,000 foot level with the goal of creating awareness and hopefully some clarity of the issues surrounding DDGS use today. Also, since approximately 30% of all US produced DDGS is exported, this webinar will also cover some topics that may be of more interest to our international partners. Before I get into the meat of the presentation, I would like to uh, give credit to the references. Probably one of the best things out there right now is the new uh, DDGS Users Handbook, 4th edition. It came out this spring, an excellent publication. I'd encourage you all to uh, go ahead and download it from uh, www.grains.org. Uh, a lot of the topics that I'll be covering today, if you want more in-depth information, uh, certainly go to that publication and it is, it is great. Also, I'd like to recognize the following individuals for the contributions to this presentation, either through the research that they've conducted but through the personal communications. That would be Dr. Rob Musser from NutriQuest, Dr. Jerry Sherson from the University of Minnesota, Dr. Hans Stein from the University of Illinois, the Swine Nutrition Team at, at Kansas State University, Mr. Caleb Worth from the U.S. Grain Council Southeast Asia, as well as uh, friends uh, and colleagues in pork producing systems throughout the country. Well, when we look at DDGS today, I think one of the best things to do is, is a commercial back from my childhood in, in the 1960s, and that's you've come a long way, baby. Uh, when we look at when the ethanol industry first started uh, going, uh, the main focus was producing ethanol, and we, and we really weren't concerned about the quality of DDGS very much. But as the industry involved, production increased, uh, all of a sudden then we, the, the ethanol companies realized that it needs to be a high quality product because that has a huge impact on the profitability 
So what's happened from the early days to now, we've, we've changed of DDGS being a byproduct to more of a, of a high quality co-product that gets a lot more attention both in processing and, and utilization. I think one of the classic slides that's been shown around the world is from Jerry Sherson, and that's initially when we looked at the variation in DDGS quality. And that's a concern that, that's been out there for a while. But when we look at DDGS production today, we see a much more uniform product available to our, to our users. I think some of the things that, that happen there, first of all, as the process have become more refined, we see a lot less variation within plant, which means we have a more consistent product coming out. Also, there's more control in the ingredients that we put into DDGS, as again, well as the processing techniques that, that we have. So when we do that, the products come out uh, are both higher in nutrient levels as well as higher in digestibility. <coughs> the following slide is from a podcast that Dr. Stein did in 2011, where basically looking at changes in total lysine levels in DDGS from 2004-2005 the middle bar 2009 to 2012, and then the last one 2015 to 16. So basically what we can see in that 11 to 12 year period, total lysine in DDGS went from 0.78 to 0.99%, basically almost a 27% increase in total lysine in those products. And, and one of the things that Dr. Stein attributed that to is better processing methods, less overheating of, of, of DDGS. Not only do the, does DDGS today have higher levels of, of nutrients, but there's been changes in digestibility. When we look at this graph, uh, the blue bars are, are data uh, from basically uh, Scherson and Stein in 2009. Uh, the yellow bars are more recent data from Espinosa and Stein in, in 2017, where we look at protein, lysine, methionine, threonine, and tryptophan digestibilities. When we look at, at protein digestibilities in that uh, eight-year period, we've seen it go from 72 to 80. Uh, lysine digestibilities increased about 5%. Methionine hasn't changed very much, but both threonine and tryptophan digestibilities have also increased over 5% just in that eight-year time period. So again, when we look at the change in DDGS, today's DDGS is higher in nutrient profile as well as higher in digestibility. Okay, uh, one of the concerns uh, that, that many people have, especially our international partners, is color. And when you, when you talk about being a victim of your own success, I think this slide does it. Early on, a lot of time was spent in educating uh, how do we tell good DDGS from bad DDGS, and it was, it was easy to focus on, on the color part of it. However, I think that, that's not as uh, uh, important or even useful today as, as it used to be. And here's a slide that a lot of us used when we talked about DDGS, especially in international markets. And uh, again, we've got three different colors, uh, a light, uh, medium, and brown. When we look at the L-star, we can see obviously that there's a, there's a decrease in, in L-star. We look at total lysine, that decreases as the product gets darker. And also when we look at, at lysine coefficient, it, it gets worse. So again, that, that's stuck in a lot of people's mind. Gold is good, as it gets lighter, it gets worse, dark DDGS is bad. But one thing to keep in mind though, that this research was done in 2007 or earlier. So again, this product, this research is on products that's at least 11, 12 years old. And so I think we, we need to understand that DDGS has changed a lot. And so based on that, color is not an accurate indicator of, of nutritional value. Uh, DDGS can be dark for a couple reasons. If it's dark because it's overheated, uh, then certainly it's going to be lower quality. The Maillard reaction kicks in, the amino acids will be less available. But it also could become darker because the type of, of grain that's used. If we're going to use uh, a grain sorghum in there, it's going to be a darker color. If we add more solubles back uh, to the solids, it's going to be darker. And then those two certainly won't have the impact on, on digestibility that overheating does. So again, color is not an accurate indicator of the nutritional value of today's DDGS. Okay, uh, Dr. Stein put together a, a one way to look at it. So if the lysine to crude protein ratio is greater than 3.4%, it is gonna be an acceptable product for poultry, swine, and aquaculture. Okay, 
Uh, here's a slide from uh, Dr. Uriola's uh, work in 2013, where they looked at the correlation between lightness of color, or L-star, and digestible lysine. There were 34 sources of corn DDGS, one source of sorghum DDGS, and two sources of a wheat DDGS. And what you can see on the slide, uh, what you can see on the slide is basically on the x-axis is L-star, and on the y is going to be digestible lysine. So if you break it out into, into two segments, uh, below 50 and above 50, uh, below 50, there's a core, uh, an R squared of 0.48 between color and digestibility, which is pretty weak. But when we look at L star above 50, it's basically non-existent. So uh, basically an R squared of 0.03. So another source indicating that there's really little correlation with today's DDGS color and, and lysine digestibility. Okay. Uh, in a more recent trial conducted by Poet Nutrition, uh, they looked at 14 samples of DDGS. The L-star ranged from 47.6 to 57.4. Amino acid digestibility ranged from 73 to 83. And so when we look at the correlation between amino acid digestibility, uh, between amino acid digestibility and color, we can see it's only 0.16. So an incredibly low and based on this, uh, color only explained 2.6% of the variability in amino acid digestibility in this trial. And to, to make it a little more graphic, when we look at color, here's three different uh, samples of DDGS used in that trial. Uh, the color of the first one is 52. The next two, it got a little bit darker. But the interesting thing is when you look below, digestibility was actually higher for the darker samples. So again, while yes, maybe 20 years ago this was something to think about, in today's DDGS, color is not a good indicator uh, in many cases of, of quality. Okay, so what does affect lysine digestibility? Uh, it has been speculated that adding solubles back to DDGS before drying can impact lysine digestibility. There's not a lot of research supporting that, but is one area that, that's discussed. I think we're all, all pretty much aware of that drying time and temperature has a huge role in it. Again, if we overheat it, we, we dry it too long, that's going to tie up some of the amino acids. And then finally, uh, if we look at the fermentation process, if it's not complete, uh, that's certainly going to affect lysine digestibility. So from, the, from a nutritional standpoint, what value do we use? And if you look at the, the DDGS handbook uh, on the section of swine, they put together equations uh, to predict uh, digestible amino acid levels. And so looking at lysine, methionine, cysteine, threonine, tryptophan, these equations give very high uh, R squared, 98 to 99, so excellent numbers. Actually, when you look at uh, values for poultry, the equations there do a great job. So when you're able to utilize these equations, I think you can feel fairly comfortable uh, when plugging those numbers into your least cost formulation for swine. Okay, now the challenge. Uh, one of the biggest changes I think that we've seen in, in the last six to seven years is what's happened to the oil content in DDGS. And uh, that's, that's changed the product a lot and has basically created a new product that we all have to figure out how to utilize uh, more effectively in livestock diets. Okay, uh, this was a survey done by Land Lakes and utilized by the U.S. Grain Council where they looked at 69 different samples of, of DDGS and found that of those 69 samples, oh, excuse me, only five of them had oil more than 9%. And if you look at 7% fat, over half of the samples uh, that were analyzed had less than 7% fat. So again, a big change in, in amount of fat that's in today's DDGS. Some data shared by NutriQuest, where they looked at changes of, of fat content in DDGS from 2011 to 2017. And I want to explain, I'll, I'll take a little time to explain this chart because it's a really good chart. So the green bar is basically DDGS that's higher than 10% fat. The dark purple is DDGS containing 9 to 10% fat. The gold is going to be DDGS with 8 to 9% fat. Uh, light purple, 7 to 8% fat. And then the red bar is when there's less than 7% fat or oil in that DDGS. And you can see in 2011, about 60% of the product uh, was full fat, 
DDGS. But by the time we got to 2017, that was probably closer down to about 6%. And also at that same time period, at least 35% of the DDGS uh, on the market today, or in 2017, had less than 7% fat. So again, in that uh, six-year time period, incredible change in the composition of DDGS, at least from a, from a fat component. When we look at average fat values in 2011, it was 10%, down to 9% in 2012, then 7.9, 7.8, 7.6, down to 7.3% average fat in DDGS in, in 2017. Okay, since we all know fat is an excellent source of energy for, for monogastrics, what's the right energy level to use? And this has probably been the biggest issue of, of disagreement within the livestock industry is how do we value uh, the new DDGS from an energy standpoint? If you look at uh, the DDGS handbook, again, fourth edition, when it comes to swine, they've got a really good formula that looks at digestible energy that utilizes gross energy, NDF, and ether extract. Looking at metabolizable energy, uh, another good equation, looking at DE, crude protein, NDF, and, and ether extract. However, this formula is only accurate if the DDGS has more than 6% uh, fat in it. There is an equation for NE, look at gross energy, ether extract, and NDF. However, that has not been validated uh, in field testing yet. So those are uh, the, the equations used in the uh, DDGS handbook. Visiting with, with some people, both domestically and internationally, there is a concern that these values, these equations, might overestimate the amount of energy that's in DDGS. Uh, another uh, uh, equation that was put together looking at that is, was from Graham et al. in 2014 from the Kansas State University Swine Nutrition Team, where they use NE, uh, basically 115 times ether extract plus 1,501. Uh, and they feel that that is, is, is fairly accurate. And basically changing the oil content 1% in DBGS is going to result in a change of net energy by 115 kcals per kilogram on an on-fed basis. Uh, the energy value that you get from this equation is going to be lower than the energy values from the DDGS handbook. Um, and may possibly underestimate the true value, but they believe that is, it, is, it is relatively close. So again, uh, this is a new area that, that we're looking at, and there are some disagreements on, on what is the right thing. So the question is, as nutritionists, what's the, the right thing to do? And I think right now, anyway, the best thing I can do is suggest that we follow the advice of, of one of my mentors, Dr. Gary Ali, who says, watch the pig, it'll tell you the answer. And so basically, we needed to have more research done looking at clarifying the energy value, and then making sure that it's validated in multiple production sites so we feel comfortable with that. So again, I think right now there's some, some uncertainty about it. In, in five years, as more research is done, we'll feel a lot more comfortable with what energy value to use, just as today we feel pretty comfortable with what amino acids and phosphorus levels to use. Okay, uh, one of the, the limitations in the past that we've had with uh, DDGS utilization in swine diets is iodine value. Uh, again, one of the other things that we talked about a lot that stuck in people's mind, that we can't go over 20% DDGS in finishing diets because we're gonna get soft bellies. And that 20% threshold, just like the color, has stuck in the back of people's minds quite a bit. And But the thing that we have to remember that today's DDGS contains significantly less fat uh, than it did when this, these trials were done. However, uh, in, in recent months, recent time, there is increased packer awareness of iodine value. And several packing plants now uh, want to make sure that that iodine value is less than 72 uh, so we don't have soft bellies. And so the question is, now that we've got reduced oil DDGS, how much of that can we add to a swine diet and still keep the, uh, the iodine value less than 72? If you look at, at research done by Wu, uh, where they looked at the effect of adding 40% DDGS on belly fat iodine value when pigs were harvested at 265 pounds. Uh, when we look at the control, uh, when we look at the control, uh, iodine value of 60, certainly very low. When we look at uh, the uh, DDGS, it had 5.9% fat, it was at 70. The, the DDGS that was at 9.9, .9, it was right at 72. So from this study, 
you can add 40% DDGS to, di uh, to diets and, and not affect iodine value above the 72 threshold with that 5.9 or 9.9% fat DDGS. And, and another trial, Graham, again from Kansas State, it was really a two by two factorial. They looked at two DDGS uh, samples, either 5.4 and 9.6% fat at two different levels, 20 and 40. And so what we see here, again, the controlled corn diet, low values of uh, iodine value, uh, both the 5.4 and the 9.6 at 20% inclusion rates were below the 70. Interesting in this trial, uh, the 5.4% fat DVGS at 40% gave us above the 72 and, and the 40 was certainly higher. As you look at trying to explain this, I think one of the, the big differences are our slaughter weight. Okay, the, the previous trial was done at, at 265 pounds. This trial was done with pigs at 285 pounds. So that might explain some of the difference as well as the belly fat IV was calculated in this trial. Okay, so how do we maximize DDGS levels while maintaining belly fat quality? Uh, obviously right now a lot of people formulate diets based on iodine value, just like we have specifications in there for lysine, calcium, and all the other nutrients. Iodine value is included in part of that least cost formulation. And there is a relationship between percent oil and iodine value. And, and one of my friends in the industry has told me, if you get above 3% fat in, in DVGS, then that's a fairly strong correlation between percent oil and iodine value. Uh, the other thing I think is really important to keep in mind is take a look at using DVGS with low percent fat. Uh, looking at some of the matrices from our industry partners, uh, I've seen that many low oil DDGSs have iodine values of 70 or less. And what this means, if you buy a low fat, low IV uh, DDGS, you could feed 100% of it and not hit the 72 threshold. So again, if it's important for you to use DDGS and still keep that iodine value of the carcass or the belly fat below 72, you need to uh, identify plants that produce low oil low IV, uh, DDGS, and, and utilize those in your feeding programs. There's the old standby, again, uh, to pull out or reduce DDGS levels the last three weeks before harvest uh, to get the IV level in, in place. And the other thing that we can do is use lipinate when appropriate uh, to change that as well. So some strategies when looking at uh, a belly fat. Okay, economic value of DDGS. Uh, one of the things, it's, it all depends who you ask, and, and especially when we, and Annie's going to talk about this, but when we talk, especially with our, with our international partners, this comes up time and time again. Uh, the, the, the buyers are the people that are buying the product, and the nutritionists are the ones that have to deal with it. But when we look from a nutritionist standpoint, we, we recognize that DDGS is more the commodity. DDGS is an excellent source of energy, digestible amino acids, and available phosphorus. But from the buyer's standpoint, they're looking at it as strictly a commodity. Maybe they're pricing it on and crude protein and fat, and, and then looking at buying the cheapest product that they can. And when this happens, typically they undervalue DDGS by 40 to, to $100 per metric ton. Some of the people that I work with in, in the U.S., they or many of the people I work with in the U.S. understand these differences. And so as nutritionists and, and, and buyers, they're going to strictly identify high-quality plants, stick with those plants, and go with it. But that's one of the things that we need to work on, especially uh, in, in, in larger companies or international partners, is getting a better line of communication between buyers and nutritionists so they can come together on, on buying the better product and being able to use, utilize it properly in, in diets. Okay, and, and here's something that was, was utilized by the U.S. Grain Council. It's put together by Dr. Rob Musser of, of NutriQuest, looking at five different samples of, of corn DDGS. Uh, varying in protein from uh, 25 to, to 29 percent, uh, fat range from 5.7 uh, up to 8, lysine from 0.82 to 0.92. So five different sources of corn DDGS that varied in, in nutrient content. So what they did then is use, using metabolizable energy, net energy, SID of lysine, methionine, threonine, tryptophan, and available phosphorus, they used a prediction equation and least cost formulation to find out what those were used for. 
If, if you look at the default prices, basically in this calculation, DDGS spot price was $182 per metric ton, corn at 138 and, and then soybean meal at 343 per ton. And what you can see in here, the relative value of all five of these DDGSs was certainly higher than the 182. And actually for, for uh, DDGSC, it was 97, it's, its value to the pig from a nutritional standpoint was $97 per ton higher than what the buyer was buying it on the spot market. So again, this, and again, all of them were higher than the spot market. So again, we need better communication with the nutritionists and the buyers to, to get that so we can, we can uh, have the most economically valuable DDGS used. Okay, other factors that impact DDGS, and I, and I love this slide because it reminds me of the great life of grad school and the interesting jobs like stripping out guts that, uh, that you get to do. So Dr. John DeYoung there, a shout out to you. Uh, we all know that as we feed more DDGS, we're gonna have more fiber in the diet and that changes dressing percent. More DDGS means uh, lower dressing percent. That does have an economic impact on the swine operation. So when we go to value products, not only do we need to look at what happens to growth performance, but what does impact does it have on carcass yield and, and carcass traits. Uh, the other thing that's changed recently, the price of synthetic tryptophan has come down. Uh, that makes it more competitive when, in terms of DDGS. So that's made it uh, a strong competitor for DDGS inclusion in, in swine diets. Uh, also, uh, the availability and price of other fiber sources have come down. Uh, producers are looking at other sources besides DDGS when looking at ways to uh, add fiber to the diets. Uh, this one was really interesting from uh, what I learned from several of our industry partners. Depending on the system you have, they're willing to pay a $10 premium uh, based on flowability because it makes that much of, a, of an issue in their feed mill and in the feed production system. So, uh, uh, and again, anybody in feed mill that's had, had bridged up bends and that kind of stuff would probably attest to that. So some of the other things that, that need to come in place. But again, I think, again, uh, as time goes on and we feel more comfortable with the nutrient values that we have, we're gonna see higher levels of uh, DDGS inclusion because we know when we formulate the diets, we're a lot closer to what we want. Uh, mycotoxins, this is more of a concern from our, from our international partners, but again, we all probably remember the year 2009, which was a terrible year for DON, so it, it can have an impact, but mycotoxins are an issue. And, and the mycotoxin in DDGS is really dependent on the mycotoxin levels in the corn that it comes from. And, and again, when we look at our corn belt, that's where the ethanol plants are. And so typically, uh, uh, mycotoxins are, are not an issue. We'll have certain spots within the U.S. each year that might have little pockets, but it's, it's very seldom that we're going to have uh, mycotoxin issues across the whole corn belt. The other thing that, that, that people forget, especially in Asia and Southeast Asia, that it tends to get cold in, in the corn belt. And so if we're combining corn in October and November, we're going to have a good five months of that corn being stored at temperatures below freezing which means mycotoxins don't grow. And so that, that gives us a half a year of a high quality product. I think that the other thing that, that comes into play, uh, it's, it's easy to sample if we're testing for lysine or protein or calcium and phosphorus, but the problem with mycotoxins is they're not uniformly distributed throughout that, that cargo. And so finding the, getting the right samples to make sure we have it representative and also lab to lab variations. So those are some of the challenges that we have with mycotoxins. Uh, utilizing the slide from the U.S. Grain Councils where they look at export cargo mycotoxin testing and basically what this does in, in U.S. corn as it reaches the export points, uh, they, they test for aflatoxins and, and, and DON or, or vomitoxin. And they don't report uh, exact levels but they put them in, in uh, frequency levels and it's determined to be a positive result if aflatoxin is above five parts per billion or DON is above 0.5 parts per million. So this slide looks at aflatoxin testing, and on the, on the x-axis down here, it is less than five parts per billion, five to 10, 10 to 20, and greater than 20 parts per billion. And uh, the light bar on the left is 2015, the middle bar is 2016, the bar on the right is, is 2017. And so what we can see uh, for most of the time, 
uh, when we're looking at, at these samples, and I think it was 430 samples, uh, you know, 90, 90% of the time it was below the, the five parts per billion. Uh, there's a few in the five to 10, uh, a, a very few between 10 and 20, and, and nothing at 20. So all samples were below the FDA action level. Fairly similar with, with vomitoxin, uh, uh, 2016, uh, we did have some higher levels. 42% uh, of the samples tested were between 0.5 and, and 2 parts per million. But again, most of them for the other years were, were all well below the, the 5 parts per million advisory role. And again, the goal for, for vomitoxin and swine diets, we want to keep it below 1 part per million. So even if we're at, at 2 parts per million and included at, at 30 or 40%, we're well below that 1 part per million threshold. So again, while this is corn levels, that's what DDGS is made for. So hopefully this will reassure our international partners that, that, that most of the corn going into DDGS is, is mycotoxin free. Uh, antibiotics, probably an, an issue that we, we tend not to think of as, as much, but it's certainly important in livestock production because what we're seeing is many livestock production systems or food producing systems, both domestic and internationally, are starting to produce animals that are antibiotic free and, and market them accordingly. Uh, some antibiotics are used to aid fermentation process in DDGS today, but its, but it's use is decreasing. Uh, in, in a study done by Paulus Compart in 2013, they found that 13% of the 159 samples DDGS tested contained low levels of antibiotic residues. But the interesting thing is when they looked at the biological value of those uh, positive samples, they found no biological value. So yes, there might have been traces of antibiotics in that DDGS, but it had no biological activity left. Uh, the, the challenge is that uh, depending how those food producing companies certify their product as antibiotic free, uh, if there's any tolerance for uh, uh, traces of antibiotics in the feed or not, or if they're just testing the food product that, that's being marketed. And again, some plants are, are taking advantage of that. Uh, there's a few of them that are producing the antibiotic-free uh, DDGS, but an, an item that is a concern. Uh, something that we probably hardly don't think about at all is that what, whatever we do nutritionally also affects the manure that comes out of the back end of the pig. And it, I know it's a little bit of a gallows humor, uh, but the last time the hog market was really low, pork producers that I work with were joking about that it uh, looks like we're feeding pigs this year for manure value. And, they, and so uh, that does have a big impact. And I want to go through an example just to let you know how, how big of an issue that is. So basically what I did, uh, it took a look at the amount of manure produced by 2,400 head wean to finish barn, uh, annual manure production, and saying, okay, the corn in this area produces 175 bushels per acre. How many acres of corn can we fertilize with manure uh, from this? And anyway, I looked at three different diets. Uh, corn soybean meal control diet, corn soybean meal with phytase, and corn soybean meal with 10% DDGS. And we're all going to get the exact same growth performance, but what differs is manure content. Okay, so this slide looks at the number of acres that we could plant based on manure nitrogen out of a 2,400 head wean to finish barn. So the control and the phytase diet, we could do 154 acres of corn. When we looked at the DDGS diet, we had more nitrogen in that manure, which meant we could fertilize 182 acres from that farm, basically almost 30 more acres from that same barn when we fed DDGS in that diet. We're gonna get the same growth performance, but there's more nitrogen in the manure, which raised the value of that manure. Phosphorus, uh, the control diet, uh, it was very high in phosphorus levels. The manure was very high in phosphorus levels. We added phytase as we expected, that decreased the phosphorus in the manure. But when we added DDGS, that gave us the lowest level of phosphorus. Because again, thinking back from a nutritional standpoint, the phosphorus in DDGS is highly available. So the value of DDGS from a phosphorus standpoint really depends where you are. If you're in a place like Northwest Iowa, that is incredibly livestock dense and you have high levels of, of soil phosphorus levels, you're certainly going to want to maximize a product like DDGS. You want to limit the amount of phosphorus in the manure. Uh, if you're in your areas that are phosphorus deficient, then DDGS may not be the product to add. But again, if, if you want to limit soil phosphorus, uh, adding higher levels of DDGS will certainly accomplish that. So in summary, 
uh, DDGS composition has changed and it will continue to evolve in the future. We'll probably see more segregation of product as, as the industry establishes those values, but it's going to continue to change. But regardless of, of those changes, we, we went from traditional to reduced oil, and even that process in itself, it is still an excellent source of energy, amino acids, protein, and phosphorus to livestock. It's just a different product that we have to learn to value differently. Uh, again, one of the great things as the industry has matured and evolved, today, today's DDGS is certainly a higher quality, uh, more consistent product. And as it becomes more consistent, it makes it much easier for nutritionists to include higher levels in the diet and feel comfortable with the product that comes out. And again, I can't stress enough that with today's DDGS, color is not a good indicator of, uh, of DDGS quality. Uh, also, again, more research is needed to establish the correct energy value uh, for reduced oil DDGS for monogastrix. Uh, DDGS value to that livestock feeder is affected by many different factors, not just growth performance, carcass quality, and, and manure value. So there's a lot of different things that come into that economic matrix. And again, again we really need to be aware of the concerns of our international partners help in the educational process and do the other things that we can do to reassure them that DDGS is a high quality product that will work for livestock across the world. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your, your time this morning and I will turn it over to Dr. Herrick. Thank you very much for that uh, great pre presentation. Uh, now might be a good time to just do another quick poll question. So Dr. Toller mentioned this in his presentation and talking about energy and some of the difficulties. So uh, our question to you is, how do you currently estimate DDGS energy? Is it an internal equation, uh, published equation, uh, through book value, supplier data, or not applicable? Do you really not look at the energy value of DDGs? So uh, when you get a chance, please answer that question. And just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions for based on Dr. Toller's uh, presentation, feel free to use the, the question on your right-hand side of your computer. Uh, we've already got a, several good questions, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. So um, our next presenter today is um, Andy Lindsay. Um, Andy will be discussing the DDG, uh, DDGS market. Um, Andy graduated from South Dakota State University with a major in animal science and a minor in ag business. Uh, after college, he worked for a local cooperative in Minnesota as a livestock production specialist. Uh, he joined Poet Nutrition in December of uh, 2012. Uh, coming to work for Poet Nutrition, um, Andy has mer merchandised Dakota Gold on truck, rail, barge, and container. Um, Andy, we look forward to your presentation. All right. Thanks, Kevin. So one of the questions that we've received a lot this year is what is going on with DDG values? This chart right here is showing your DDGs as percent of corn uh, relative to Decatur. As you can see on the right here, we are at the highest level we've been. In a, in a couple of years. And, and right back here, we had Chinese buying in the market, which we have not seen since, you can see this blue bar right here, that's when the Chinese tariffs increased up to roughly 90%, and you just did not see any more buying from, from China at all. Now, we knew that was coming as an industry. We had been going through an anti-dumping investigation for uh, well over a year at that point, but what we didn't know was coming up until, you know, we got to about August, September, was that Vietnam was, was starting to become a, a questionable market and whether or not we were going to have access to that market in 2017. And then we coupled that when that market went out in December with a corn crop in the eastern corn belt that had high vomitoxin. And when you layered all three of those together, you had loss of Chinese demand, loss of demand from Vietnam, and then we also lost some uh, demand in the Eastern Corn Belt from your local swine producers there. And that really, that really all hit together and drove us down to where we ended up in this, you know, bottoming out 60, 70 percent relative value to corn. And it was, it was really a challenge to figure out what we were going to do with all the DDGs at that point, because we did have increased production coming at us. If you look at a chart later, you'll see DDG production continues to continues to increase steadily. So this chart looks at oh yeah, no one had 
This chart looks at your DEG value relative to corn price in the Gulf. And you can see up here, kind of same story that we're looking at today, high DDG value compared to what corn is trading at in the Gulf. And one of the largest spreads we've seen uh, uh, almost ever. If you take this chart, you went back a couple months in 2015, back to April, May, June, you'd see that the DDG value was a little higher at that point relative to corn as well. But that's when the Chinese market was completely wide open and they were purchasing 900,000 tons a month. So we had a lot of Chinese demand, but this dip right here in the middle, you can see where corn was higher than DDG, which is not very typical in the Gulf. Usually the Gulf trades 100 to 110% value of corn, but we have this stretch right here, which correlates directly with that dip that we saw on the previous slide. And if you look at exports through the Gulf, Sorry, right, we're having a clicker issue here. All right, here we go. We're on it. So if you get and take a look at the exports through the Gulf back in 2017, you can see there's this stretch right here where we're a little higher. If you take this January through about July timeframe and just level it out, we're at about 425,000 tons a month of exports going through the Gulf. If you take that shot out and take a look at all the months previous and all the months after, it averages out to about 300,000 tons a month through the Gulf, which is a pretty normal flow headed through the Gulf in bulk exports. That time frame where we were at 425,000 tons a month, that was when the Eastern Corn Belt just didn't know what to do with DDGs, so they were just loading them on, on barges and sending it to the Gulf. And it's really your only effective storage that you can kind of come up with is all of those barges that we just kind of loaded and floated. And if you look at that yellow line down or the orange line down here at the bottom, that's your exports to Turkey. And you can see the increases in bulk exports correlate pretty well with those increases in exports to Turkey. Turkey was really the country that came in and bought a lot of that high bomb product and helped really kind of clean out the market. So if you look at this chart again, when we started this started this climb, we got Vietnam back in the market somewhere right around September. And you can see that jump was was really in July corresponding with an increase in product going to Vietnam, or the, the expectation that Vietnam was moving back into the market. Then we got into new crop corn, corn cleaned up, we started to get that eastern corn belt swine demand back. And then as we transitioned through the first of the year, Argentina's crop really kept shrinking. And then you saw soybean meal climbing, and that started pushing you know, international, domestic protein values higher. You also had increased canola going to China, which shortened up the canola supply in the Western Corn Belt, drove that price higher. So you really had a lot of demand that came back to DDGs and then a lot of protein values that started changing, helping DDGs gain more value in a lot of different markets. So between all of that, we really started to, to drive the value of DDGs higher. And it takes a long time for people to start changing their inclusion rate. So we see DDGs go too low, then we see DDGs go too high. And the other thing that we've seen in the market as well is your Catalan feed number has increased. You can see back in 2017, that number started to really shoot up. And then in 2018, we've had this high Catalan feed number. And you know we've heard a lot of people talk about cattle demand in Nebraska being really high, the truck market there being really strong. And when you get a lot of cattle on feed, those cattle eat a lot. It was a cold winter. When it's cold, they eat a lot as well. The other thing that we look at is hog and pig inventory. And the, the inventory of hogs and pigs keeps, keeps going up. So that's increased demand domestically. You can see that in Iowa where we have more demand in Iowa. There are more feed mills going up. Plants are running harder. 
So even though we continue to have this increase in DDG production, we find that you know, we keep having uh, demand for it as well. Here's your DDG production. If you look, your DDG production just steadily continues to increase. There is a dip shown in 2018. Uh, I don't know if that's, it's tough to say if that's really going to be a dip in actual production. Uh, from what it looks like right now, you probably will see increased DDG production in 2018 as well, rather than a decrease. And then exports, there's a, there's a trend line that continues to go up. You can see in 2015, we had a little bit of a spike that was, again, an open market to China, which they've been out of the market for the most part since. The DDG exports have, have been a little lower since then, but we continue to see that you've got, got more demand for DDGs in that international space as producers continue to learn more about it and it becomes a, a better known product in the, in the international markets. Uh, people are looking at increasing DDGs and including DDGs in their diets. And you know, we don't have international customers that take it out as long. They'll keep it in, starting to see the value in it more. And, and that's really helping support the DDG values. So going forward, at some point we're going to get Chinese demand back. Nobody really knows when it, when it will happen, but at some point it will return and then you'll see DG values will will go up in, in correspondence with it. But you know, current trade relations are somewhat shaky and that's really had a, a downward effect on, on DG values. Um, we're starting to see that seasonal trend take place. In the summertime, we usually see DG values start to dip. And if we took a couple of those slides out earlier and just took them a couple weeks farther ahead, you'd see that that trend is starting to happen. In the summertime, that cattle on feed number dips. Hogs in Iowa eat a little less. And we just end up with this, you know, kind of increased production that, that pushes values a little bit lower. But as we said earlier, international markets continue to develop. The world population, middle class continue to grow. Expectations would be for animal production to continue to increase worldwide. And so even though we continue to increase ethanol production, DDG production, you know, we expect that we'll continue to see, see demand for that product and, and prices should continue to be at least stable. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your presentation, Andy. A um, couple of great presentations, and now we can kind of move into the, the question and answer session. So uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the question bar on the right-hand side of your screen. Our first question is uh, directed towards um, Dr. Toller. Uh, Dr. Toller, you suggested that we should use the term co-product, and that's fully agreed. However, AFCO does not recognize the term co-product. Uh, what do we have to do to stop DDG as being thought of as the second grade byproduct? Uh, that's a really good question. I think one of the things that we do is, is just a continuation of the education process. So uh, as long as we can show from a, from a nutritive standpoint, from, you know, from the, the digestibilities, the, the, the components that are in that feed, that it has changed, that it is a higher quality, if, they, if the nutritionists and buyers recognize that change in quality, looking at the hard numbers, then hopefully that will, uh, that will spur the increased use of that product. Um, our next question is for, for Andy. Um, Andy, you touched on it briefly uh, as far as the trade, but uh, what effect do you think that the trade war uh, will have on DBGS value? Well, so far you've seen soybean meal and soybean prices trending lower since the you know trade wars have escalated with China. And if you look at the board crush, the board crush has been really, really large. And that's been driving your protein prices down, increasing crush, and then subsequently also driving corn down as it tracks with tracks with soybeans. And so we've seen DG values as as a seasonal trend, we should start trending lower, but we've seen that to really start to move lower a lot faster than it normally would this time of year, just because you've had corn that's been selling off. And when we have, you know, 20 cent down days on soybeans, you see corn go down five, seven, eight cents. And that makes DDG values just push lower as well. So you know, we didn't have any demand from China 
you know, in the market anyway. They they haven't been pulling DDGs. So from a, a DDG demand standpoint, the the trade wars with China haven't really done too much to change, you know, S and D. But the lower soybean meal prices, lower bean prices, has really depressed values. Thank you. Um, next question is directed to uh, Dr. Toller. Uh, so a couple parts to the question. Uh, buyers and nutritionists need better communication. Uh, the first part of that is um, how would you correct this? And then the second part is uh, many of our international partners, uh, especially small to medium feed mills, may not have a trained nutritionist to rely on book values for nutrient content and then use a canned formulation program. Um, in this situation, buyer may rule over formulator. Uh, how would you suggest correcting this? Again, uh, and a lot of these issues basically comes down to education. So somehow, you know, get the, the, the head buyers, get the nutritionists in the room, and, and go through some of the slides like we talked about. That again, there is a value for for more de or for more lysine in the diet. There's there's energy value. Here's what the digestibility differences mean. So from our system. The difference between a low quality and a high quality DDGS means this many dollars difference in a production system. And, uh, and so bring them together. And, and, and you're right, the second thing about the small to, to the medium size, you know, they may not, may not have a nutritionist on there. I think uh, agencies like the U.S. Grains Council has done an excellent job about trying to get some of the education out there. And so that might be another format. I know at least in, in Vietnam, the U.S. Grain Council uh, this uh, summer is looking at a feed formulation uh, a seminar workshop targeted specifically at those small to medium companies. So again, yes, they may not have real or a system like that, but there's other least cost formulation out there that might be cheaper. And then uh, working with things like the U.S. Grain Council or other companies that have a good matrices for nutrients, uh, plug those in there. So uh, hopefully that'll help. But you know, then the other problem that, that you get in some of those those places is the amount that you can buy. You know, and if you're talking, uh, you know, somebody's bringing the container in and then four feed companies each buy a quarter of a container, you know, how do you make that work too? Okay, all good points. Yeah. Um, next question is, is addressed to, to both. Um, and I guess we're curious, how much lower do you think the industry will go with the oil extraction? And uh, what are the effects do you think that it will have on animal performance? Uh, Dr. Toller, maybe you want to take a first shot at that? And Man, I, I wish I would have paid more attention to my biochemistry classes. Uh, you know, physically, from, from a manufacturing standpoint, I don't know what, what the lowest level, you know, they, they can drop that down in. Uh, at, at some point, you would think I'd have to, the, the efficiency of oil extraction, you're, you're, going, you're going to reach a plateau where it's not economical to remove anymore. You know, that, that I won't, I, I, can't, I can't address. Uh, but the other thing is, as you as you change the oil content, you may also change a little bit the species that utilize it. And again, I know uh, as a swine nutritionist, when I saw the decrease in, in oil happening in DDGS, I thought, oh, great, you know, DDGS prices are going to drop. Well, what's happened, the, the dairy and the beef nutritionists are using a lot more of it. So uh, if, it, if it drops lower, we may see uh, a little more transition to the ruminant. Uh, but the other thing I think, uh, especially from a research standpoint, we need to do a better job of understanding the value of fiber. And, you know, we always used to kind of kind of blow it off, but, in, you know, in the last 10 years, we're understanding that monogastrics can utilize certain portions of that fiber. And so as, as DDGS gets more fiber, uh, we need to do a little bit more uh, research to understand the value of the different components of that fiber. Great. Andy, your thoughts? Yep. I don't think it's any secret that Poet's been one of the leaders in oil extraction and kind of at the forefront of that. And it seems like, you know, it's, it's probably pretty tough to get more than more than what, you know, a pound of bushel um, ends up being. And so does it go much slower? Uh, it, you know, it's going to take it's going to take a while. And I don't know how much lower you can really get without adding in something like a hexane extraction. Uh, so probably not a lot lower in the foreseeable future. Uh, as far as how that affects the industry, you know, when we really started to pull oil out, you saw a lot of hesitancy from uh, customers about, you know, can we use this product? What's it mean for energy? How do we value it? And some that just plain didn't want to 
even take a look at using it. But since then, there's been more research done and those hesitancies around the energy value have really you know, gone away for a lot of people. And it's looked more as a, a protein source. People look at it for the phosphorus. You know, some of the, the gut health issues, especially in like swine with the fiber content in cattle, you know, they take a look at it and all right, well, the fiber content has a lot of energy there as well. So from a from an oil standpoint, I think the industry probably starts to get to a more homogenous product and there are, isn't as much variation, but as far as going a lot lower, I don't know if it goes uh, much farther lower than four or five percent DG. Okay. Um, based on, on your comments, we actually got another question. So if we go to 100% oil extraction, then uh, separate the protein from fiber, we have three new high value products, oil, protein for poultry and aqua, and fiber for ruminants. Um, the future is in further processing. So more of a comment than a question, but would you guys agree? I would agree with that. It, if, even if you take a look at some of your plants in Nebraska, they're starting to add in uh, fiber extraction, protein extraction products. So now you're getting some 50% um, protein products. And it seems to be that that could be more the direction the industry goes is fractionating things off and then trying to create higher value products that way rather than just straight oil extraction. I'd agree. I've uh, talked with some of our industry partners. I've heard the same thing that they're looking at, you know, segregating into high protein lines, high fiber lines. And, and again, from a nutritional standpoint, that, that makes it even better. You know, as again, those products become more specialized, more uniform in consistency, it makes it much easier to put into a, a software package and, and, and get a good diet out. So I think, you know, just like everything else, we're going to see a continuing evolution of, of the process. And as new technologies are developed or used, uh, that's going to further the change. Okay. Well, great. Well, on that point, I think we've come to the end of our time. So um, we'd like to thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, if you'd like to see a recording, we will have this uh, recording available on dakotagold.com. And we also have a lot of con contact information. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact. Thank you very much.